Welcome to this episode of Unraveling Adoption, an intentional space to delve into adoption's complexities together. I'm Beth Syverson. I'm an adoptive mom of a talented and insightful 20-year-old son, Joe, who is trying to launch into adulthood. I'm walking beside him while working on my own personal growth and healing. I'm also a certified coach helping primarily adoptive parents, and Joe and I are committed to helping anyone touched by adoption, and we want to help the general public understand adoption's complexities better too. Today's guest is Paul Fiscus. He's a natural father to a five-year-old daughter, Eliza, who he hasn't seen since she was an infant. Talk about complexities. (laughs) His story highlights the injustices caused by the adoption industry's favor toward the adoptive parents. To me, it seems super logical that if there is a natural parent who's willing to parent and who is safe, that that child is not an quote unquote orphan and should not be adopted. But that's not what happened to Paul. Hang on and take some deep breaths, everyone, because Paul and Eliza's story is heartbreaking and frustrating. Thank you for coming on Unraveling Adoption to share your story, Paul. I think it's important that we all understand that these kinds of things continue to happen. So welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start at the beginning. How old were you when you found out you were going to be a father? How was that? What was your relationship like with the natural mother of your daughter? I was actually, I was 39. I dated the mother for about two months. That was really casual. Um, She was my boss at my second job. Mm -hmm. So... But we had already split up by the time she found out she was pregnant. Okay. So you're 39, you dated your boss for a short time. She got pregnant. And then after you were already broken up, she tells you, hey, I'm pregnant. And how did that, uh, how did that go for you? Well, she was very manipulative, but at first Mm -hmm. things were, you know, great, but I didn't realize that she had, she actually slept with three different men in a week of conception. And I had no idea, but. That never deterred me because I wasn't, at that point, we were already platonic. So I'm like, oh, well, that stinks that you did that, but okay. I'm still going to, I need to step up if, that, if that's my child. Yeah. So. How did you find out, like, when can you take a test to find out if that's really you? You can do, there are some prenatal tests, but we, uh-huh. we chose to wait. Well, when we, things are great, we still, she's chosen to wait until the, after the baby was born. Okay. And that was, they kind of tried to use that against me actually, but. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Okay. But you were trying to be, you know, collaborative. You were going to co-parent, but not be together. Is that right? Right. Okay, like right. you both were going to share the duties. Yeah. Co-parenting. We had, a, I mean, we were trying to discuss a co-parenting plan. She is bipolar mm-hmm. and she, she went off her meds before the pregnancy. So Oof. as time progressed, she started getting really envious because I bought a house. I was mm-hmm. involved. And um, I think she was scared I was going to take the child from her or something. Wow. And I think that's the main motivation for her. To- Sounds like she was getting paranoid. Wow. So you bought a house to be more stable yeah. for the baby. For the baby, yeah. And the natural mother, instead of saying, wow, well, look, he's trying to be stable and take care of our baby, she gets uh, like freaked out and paranoid. Yeah. She started saying like, well, I know we want a parenting plan, but I'm not going to let her be there with you until I'm comfortable with it. I'm like. You know, she would contradict herself within the same sentence. And oh, wow. It was almost a precursor for the adoption proceedings, actually. Yeah, it sounds like what you had to do with later. That sounds crazy making. And so she's still pregnant and kind of threatening that you won't be able to see your baby. And then she would say, well, you know, it might not even be yours. So, oh, she's how old was Eliza when you were able to confirm your paternity? Two months or so. Okay. So you ended up doing the test and you were the dad. Yeah. Wow. So, but for those first two months, were you able to see her? Well, they induced her by a week so that I would miss the birth. <gasps> she did that on purpose? She did it on purpose. Yeah. And the adoptive couple had her two days after she was born. <gasps> okay. So somewhere in the middle of midway through the pregnancy and having a baby, she decided to relinquish. Yeah. And did you know that? No. <sighs> So she got pregnant in January. Uh, Eliza was due on September 26th. She was born on September 19th. Okay. On July 30th, the natural mother cut off, just ghosted me. Wow. And oh, so you had no idea what was going on. No, I had no idea. And that's at the coaching of the adoption attorney. Of course. So but I'm sitting here thinking, okay, 
I can't imagine that she's trying to do that, you know? So I'm sitting here, I'm just yeah, going to yeah. give her space. I, I kept texting her on and off saying, Hey, I'm still here. Okay. Okay. You know, I don't know what's going on, but I always try to calm everything down. Yeah. Okay. So you're the type that kind of cools everybody off and it's okay. Everything's okay. And you probably figured she was hormonal and emotional and whatever. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Every time I would talk to her, it's like, it was so volatile. I had no idea who I was going to be talking to, like either the sweet, oh, we're going to be parents or the, the opposite of that. Uh, (laughs) So she's bipolar. Wow. Okay. Wow. So how did you find out she had given birth a week before that you thought it was going to happen? It's interesting. Her aunt contacted me. Oh, okay. Because her aunt, she did the same thing to her aunt. Like most of her family is on my side. Would her aunt have taken her, the baby? If I was not in the position. Yeah, 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 yeah. They would have been willing to take the baby as well instead of having the baby be adopted. Right, yeah. Oof. So even if I Oof. wasn't in the picture, she had family that wanted her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That, so, well, that should never happen. I, Oh, God, this just hurts my heart so bad. Every unethical thing you can think of has happened in this case. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it sounds absolutely horrible. It doesn't seem like that far of a reach to say, well, you've got people in the family that are willing and able to take this child then they should not be adopted. Yeah, based on the ethical, by the, uh, I think it's the Northwest Adoption Committee, like babies should be with a family if yes. they want her. Yes. But, you know, oh. instead she was treated as a commodity. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this aunt of your child on the birth mom's side was an ally toward you and is still, right? Sounds like? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so wow, this sounds like your natural mom is really hurting and having a lot of mental health issues. And it it sounds like maybe the lawyer was taking advantage of all of that, all of that chaos. Um, I mean, I think they were all on the same page, but yeah. Oh, okay. So what was the birth mom getting out of this whole thing? She just wanted to relinquish and not have to see the baby anymore? For some reason, she just was so envious that she refused to let me bear my own child. She got paid $3,000 for reasonable living expenses when she didn't have any living expenses at all. Okay. So for those that don't know, adoption agencies and lawyers and private adoptions often will offer, you're not allowed to technically pay for a baby, but you can pay for their reasonable living expenses Right, and it can add up and it can also be used as a weapon. If a birth mother changes her mind, I think they threaten that she would have to pay it back or things like that. It becomes like I think a they would, yeah. really bad situation. God, anytime you add money into anything, right? <laughs> so, so she got paid three thousand dollars for quote unquote reasonable living expenses, even though she was living with her folks or something. Or well, she was living with her boyfriend and okay. not having to pay anything and not paying rent. Yeah. Okay. She had no bills whatsoever from May until the date of the birth. <sighs> Wow. Okay. So she got $3,000 and didn't have the stress of seeing her child taken by you or shared with you or any of that. So I would have never kept her from her. Just so oh, I shouldn't have said taken. Uh, like she couldn't stand the thought of co-parenting. It sounds like she just like couldn't. She's had two children since and both those fathers are not in the picture. So she kept those. So it's a control oh. thing. It's part of the bipolar. Like <gasps> they can have extreme oh. paranoia. They can have uh, racing thoughts and make oh. impulsive decisions. Yeah. Okay. So so she had two other kids in, that she kept because the man wasn't in the picture at all. Right. No one else was wanting to share the baby. Wow. Okay. It, it sounds crazy because it is. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like she's really unbalanced and struggling. <sighs> And it sounds like the adoption industry, which is a billion dollar industry, was happy to help, happy to help her out, right? Yeah. I think you told me that the lawyer worked for her and the adoptive family. Is that right? Technically, yeah. Like she didn't have a separate lawyer. Well, on the paperwork, it's a separate lawyer, but all he did was write a name. Oh, it is. Because it was, you know, he was double dipping. Oh, okay. She didn't pay him anything, though. I mean. But he was controlling the whole situation, sounds like. Yeah, like every court hearing we would have, he'd flip flop between who he was representing. Oh, man. So I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, I mean, there's so much I can tell you about how unethical this has been. It sounds horrible. And, you know, like I, I'm the first father in Kansas history to fight this diligent. I, you know, I could be the first in the country. Wow. I mean, I don't want to say that because I don't know, but uh-huh. of all my research, which I've spent almost 6,000 hours on it now. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, Whoa. it's just been my number one since the day one, it's been my number one priority. 
my daughter. Now, you know? did you understand law before this happened or no. have you had to dig in? You're like just a person, not a lawyer or anything. I'm, I'm just a person. But now I probably <laughs> know more than any adoption lawyer, in, at least in Kansas. I bet. I bet. And I've seen your website is filled with all sorts of legal language that I don't totally understand. And yeah. it, it's so complicated. You've really had to dig in. And, and it sounds like you've tried many things to try to get her back. So, yeah, you know, it's second nature for me. So I keep forgetting that it's confusing to most people. Oh, the legalese. Yeah. Yeah. You're um, in it so deeply that it just it makes sense to you. But for someone else, my eyes start getting blurry and like, Ugh. oh, yeah. <laughs> But you've really dug in. What all steps have you had to take? What have you done so far? Well, on the state level, I got thwarted at the District Court, Court of Appeals, and the Kansas Supreme Court. I filed a writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, wow. And that was the first pro se, which by myself is what that means. Oh, okay. That's the first pro se brief I ever wrote. Wow. That got declined. Then I went to federal court as a civil complaint uh-huh. because it was a civil conspiracy. I got thwarted mm-hmm. there. After that, I filed about 33 letters with every congressman wow. trying to go that route because they do have the power to change things. I got nothing from them. Wow. And then I filed a motion for relief from judgment back at the trial court Uh because they violated due process. So it's a void judgment. Mm -hmm. And then he denied it for timely, (sighs) even though it's a motion that specifically has no time limit. (gasps) Oh my gosh. Yeah. What what are the reasons all these entities dismissed your case? What did they tell you? Well, at first my rights were terminated for not providing the mother with support for the last six months, even though I clearly did. Yeah. The last six months of her pregnancy, you mean? Of the pregnancy, yeah. Okay. And this is the same law in pretty much every state. A father has to provide support to the mother the last six months. And here it's void for vagueness because it just says to provide support. What does that mean? It means it's it's, it's unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean like a few texts or it, does that mean? It means mean that like- the judge can say whatever he wants. <sighs> it don't matter what you do. He says it's not enough. Shoot. And of course, logically, she didn't need anything. I still offered her as much as I could. Yeah, you. It's almost as if I had to stalk her in order to keep my rights. Yeah, right. She ghosted you. And if you would be too persistent, she would say you're harassing her. Yeah. You know, you can't win either way on that one. There are a lot of, there's a lot of those double-edged swords in this. They try to yeah. do that in every, which way they can. Oh, man, that must be so frustrating. But my case is so tilted in my side that it's like anybody that looks at her like, wait, what? Yeah. Because first of all, all the effort I've made and plus yeah. just the facts of the case. Yeah. And do you ever talk to the adoptive parents? Do you have access to them at all? No, they refuse to talk to me. They refuse to talk to they you. They won't let me see my daughter. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're just as ethical as the yeah. adoption attorney and the mother and the judges, unfortunately. Yeah. And I suppose we have no idea what's going through their head, but they probably said, well, we went through the legal channels. We did this the proper way. We're her parents now. Da-da-da-da. First of all, the first thing they filed was a petition to terminate my rights. They made it sound like they had no idea who the father was because she did sleep Uh, with three different guys. But I showed up and filed paternity not knowing if it was my biological child or not. Yeah, you were willing to. Because I was already committed. Yeah. You know, he made me out to be the the biggest jerk. The initial petition had no factual basis, which that's illegal. You can't just file Mm. a petition without any facts. Wow. So I requested a, you know, hey, you need to do a, a, it's a bill of particulars, which is like, I need to know what you're pleading so I can know what to defend myself on. Yeah. Yeah. Give me some more details. They were late on getting that back in. So I filed a motion to dismiss the whole thing. And the judge just gave him 14 more days. Mm. So in the petition, the amended one, they said I was unfit. They said I was, um, I abandoned her. And they said that I, I didn't support her. That must have just hurt your heart so bad. How did you manage that? Kind well, at first I'm sitting here like, you know, I'm going with common sense and there's no way you're getting my kid because by the law. Right. You're probably incredulous at that point. Right, that, yeah. oh, well, this will turn around. So at the ruling, I'm sitting there, I'm just looking at the judge and then he starts going. I'm like, and I'm just like, what? He had to tell me to leave the courtroom twice because I'm like, did you just say that? Like, what did he say? Oh, he just said basically what they, they were saying that I didn't support her and I was wow. doing all these. I did drugs and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I was being mean to her. Like I did. I wasn't supportive. I'm like, none of that matches the facts in the case. Yeah. On the record. Did anyone ever do any sort of home study? I know they do that for adopted parents, but do they ever, like in a case like this, know. nobody ever came and checked to make sure you were safe? I requested to have her overnight. Yeah. And instead, they made me drive 450 miles every weekend <gasps> just to see her four hours each weekend day. Oh, wow. She moved away then? 
the adoptive parents live in West Kansas and I'm in Wichita, which is in East Kansas. Oh yeah. So it's about a four, yeah, about four hour drive. That's a long and boring drive. Good Lord. I've made that drive. I had the, like in February of 19, we had a blizzard. So it took me like six hours to get there and about seven miles outside of town, they tried to cancel the visit. Oh. And yeah, and I had, I got stranded. So I had to hitchhike into town and the only way I got them to let me see my child was like, okay, well, I get her for eight hours tomorrow then. Okay. All right. So they live a mile away from the hotel, which is where we agreed at. Uh-huh. And as the adoptive father was handing my child, my child to me, he just said, this is BS. <gasps> and I, I mean, like, I just looked at him and like, if you weren't handing my child to me right now, you would be on, you know, I'd be hitting you. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you were so angry. Oh, uh, but oh, yeah, actually I wasn't because I had my child in my, my hands. Sure, sure, so. sure. Yeah. So you're going to have your eight hours with your child in a hotel. That must be kind of awkward. Like yeah, it was you, kind of, you're not at your house or, you know. That's another thing. When a judge makes a discretionary decision that involves constitutional rights like this, uh-huh, he's uh-huh. supposed to give a reason why. Yeah. Like this judge didn't do anything he was supposed to do. Like the rule <sighs> of law, like he didn't follow any precedent, any procedural law. Oh, and I, I guess they can just do that because the whole judiciary is insane. Wow. And so you're, you, I'm just wondering where you're putting all that anger. I guess it's going toward uh, reading legal documents. Is that what you're doing? You're, you're dumping yourself into learning the legal processes? And- yeah. I mean, afterwards, after all, after they terminate my rights and yeah, I mean, I do have PTSD. Yeah, I bet. I've had blackouts. Yeah. I, I broke my hand punching the wall, apparently. Whoa. I when I you were blacked out? Doing it. Yeah. When Whoa. I was blacked out, I don't know if you can see it, but see that. <gasps> oh, wow. Yep. I I'm left-handed, so I, was, I knew I was blocked out because I punched with my right hand. <laughs> and I'm not a violent person, but, you know, it's just... Sure. Oh, that anger has to come out somehow. It has to, and, yeah. Yeah. So what do you do to help your PTSD and to help moderate that anger so you can continue your life? Well, I, I play music a lot. Oh, yeah. I do try to meditate sometimes, but yeah. I, I, can't say, I can't say for sure that I've done a lot of positive things to help, uh-huh. but... um. I bet the music does help, though. Yeah. Is it angry music? Um, I try not to write. I mean, some of it is because, like, I, you know, it's kind of Nirvana-ish. Oh, okay, Nirvana. So okay. punk rock. So some of the songs are pretty angry, All but right. I'm versatile. I try not. I mean, I've written like I think I've written about 400 songs since 2019. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's put a lot of work into that. Music has saved you. It sounds like my son and I are both musicians too, and we both believe wholeheartedly that music has saved our lives several times. It's it's very healing to the soul. Very powerful. But yes. I've had a lot of problems. Like I've gone through a lot of jobs. I bet. Like I just got I just got fired yesterday, to be oh, honest with you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But it's I mean it's the thing is with PTSD is I, I'll start crying uncontrollably. Oh. And I can't I can't stop it. So Oh, that's tough at work. It's definitely Shoot. tough at work because I try not to tell anybody and no one ever really fully understands, so they usually just think I'm either BSing them or... So you just disappear for a while until you can get yeah. yourself together. Yeah. And I was oh. I worked for a surgery center, so I, I took off at lunch. I just went home. Okay. And after a couple of hours, I texted my boss and explained that, and she, she fired me, so... Oh, but, oh I mean, that's so horrible. It is what it is. I It really sucks, but, I mean, I'm trying, like... Right now, I'm at, you know, we were talking about what all I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm at the U.S. Supreme Court again, Mm -hmm. filing a writ for them mishandling my motion for relief. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's where I'm at now. I'm waiting to hear back. I filed the writ of certiorari on October 16th, Mm -hmm. and it's December 6th, and I haven't heard anything back. So I have no idea how that whole machine works, but I bet they're not super efficient. I'm just going to guess. They're not super helpful. I bet. I've called the, I've called the U.S. Supreme Court clerk like five or six times. They never answer and they never call me back. So. And do you have a lawyer helping you at all or is this all self-advocacy? So the first, of course, I had a trial lawyer who is actually okay. still a really good friend of mine. Okay. I had a court of appeal, appellate lawyer. So you've kind of tried lots of different ways. I spent $30,000. I bet, yeah. In a fight that I never had a chance, Shoot. even though I should have had a chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, God, and that time that you had the eight hour visit in the blizzard with your daughter, was that the last time you saw her? or Did you get to see her after that? So she was born in September. I started seeing her 
Unfortunately, I had to wait until the test results. Okay. So the beginning of November, and this is all 2018. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning of November of 18 through the beginning of March of 19, okay. I got to spend four hours with her or eight hours. Okay. So overall, I've only spent 56 hours with my child. Okay. You were able to and count And the last her. time I saw her, she cried for me as I was walking away. And I'm thinking, well, I'll just see you here in a couple of days. Uh, and here it is five years almost. Oh, that must just, is that the, one of the PTSD triggers that you have that image of you walking away and hearing her cry? Of hearing her cry. Yeah. That yeah. really messes me. Yeah. I can imagine. Oh, when you see a little, little five-year-old girl walking around town, do you just go, huh? I wonder what my daughter's doing. It's hard for me to be around any, yeah. I can't be around children. Any kids, I bet. Yeah. I mean, I. There's children in my life, so I can't be like that. But yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. yeah. I, t I cry a lot. So I bet. I don't blame you. I, it's a horrible, horrible thing that happened to you, and it's just not right. Can you put together any rhyme or reason who's getting something out of this? Why would they be so against you? What's the deal? I, I've, I have a couple of theories. If it's adoption lawyer paying off each judge. Okay. There's no way he's made any money off of this. Yeah. So I, I right. don't know if, if that's the case, then he's just fighting me out of spite. Okay. I mm -hmm. honestly think that they manipulate their, you know, there's incentives for the state from the federal for foster adoptions. Mm -hmm. and I think somehow they manipulate that to get for any adoption. Oh, could be. Because there has to be something. There has to be some kind of incentive for them to completely go against what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were telling me that the judge and the lawyer were both on some sort of adoption committee. Yeah. On the Kansas Adoption Law Committee. Yeah. So, so that lawyer and the judge that has seen. The trial judge. Okay. Are on the so conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. So they shouldn't really be taking any cases about adoption if they're on the committee. Um, they should not be working together at all. I mean, they shouldn't. Oh, working together. Technically, because they're on that adoption committee. It, well, technically, it's not a law in Kansas. But commonsensically, uh -huh. that lawyer should never be in front of that judge. Yeah. That seems like insider. They, they got a nice little, yeah. Yeah. And I said that it's a billion dollar industry. There's money going all sorts of directions. The government is paying for placements and adoptive parents are paying lawyers and there's just money rolling around. So. Yeah. And the thing is, they're so used to steamrolling, you know, one, most fathers, and I, I've never understood this. Most fathers give up. Yeah. I cannot give up on my child. So I'm like, I don't understand. I can't even grasp the concept. Yeah. yeah. And I've done so much research. Like they, they can't do what they're done. Yeah. But I'm getting almost every avenue is gone legally. Yeah. God, it must be so frustrating. What is your hope? What is your last straw? What, what do you have left? <laughs> What I'm at right now is the last legal thing I can do, which anytime you file like a writ of to the U.S. Supreme Court, you have about a 1% chance. Okay. They get maybe five or 6,000 of writs every year oh, and they wow. grant maybe 100. Wow. So this is your last Hail Mary. Yeah. Huh? And, this is, and this is almost like, this is time I've created because mm -hmm. I'm the first father to ever file a motion for relief from judgment. Wow. So I think that's why they were so blatantly violative this time around because they're like, We've never seen this before. Oh, who does he think he is? Oh, shoot. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. yeah. Who do I, yeah. Yeah. But they, the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't looked at a case like this since 1989. Wow. Wow. And actually the last case, and you might have heard of this one, the adoptive couple versus baby girl. Um, if you haven't, it's Dustin Brown. It's an ICWA situation. Oh, 2013. Okay. ICWA is Indian, Indian Children's, Children's Welfare. Act, something yeah. like that. Indian Children Welfare Act. Mm -hmm. So Dustin Brown, you know, the mother did what the mother of my kid did. Okay. And I, I'm Indian too, by the way, but oh, yeah. my tribe wasn't federally recognized. Okay. So that couldn't be used. A whole other issue there. <laughs> and honestly, they manipulate that too, because yeah. um, you still have to be married to the mother. Oh, really? I'm like, well, then what was the whole point of bringing that up? Ugh. Yeah, Dustin Brown, the, the adoptive couple versus girl. The father got his child. Okay. And then he had his daughter for two years uh -huh. before the U.S. Supreme Court granted the couple's writ <gasps> and, grant, and then turned it over. So after two years of being with her real father, he had to give her to this adopted uh, couple. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. How is that? 
How does that make any sense? That does not make any sense. That's horrible. And that's horrible to do to that child. And oh, that dad must have just been heartbroken to lose her. I, I can't imagine. Like I've, so if, I haven't reached out to him. So I was going to say, like, do you guys get together? <laughs> These dads have been wronged like this or? Some, I mean, there is a group. Yeah. Christopher Emanuel. He was in North Carolina. He was kind of a situation like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's actually a Saving Our Sisters yeah. Which is, uh, have you heard of them? Yes, I know them well. They help mostly birth moms right. that change their mind or whatever, but they help you guys too? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're sweet. I, the people are there at the hospitals like vultures. Yeah, they are. Just trying to get these children from these mothers who just gave birth, yep. who are drugged up and confused. Here, sign here. It's like, it's disgusting. It is. It is. Yeah. Saving Our Sisters is so, I'll put the link to them in the notes. And Definitely. regular old people can go help Saving Our Sisters, by the way. And they can't help you probably because they only help like right in the moment. Well, what Renee did was she tried to put me in touch with a couple of reporters okay. and she was just giving me emotional support. Like okay, she's yeah. a very sweet, sweetheart, you know? Yeah. They're doing good work. But yeah, you're right. There's nothing really they can do beyond that. But yeah. just having that kind of support. Because like at this point, a lot of my support, they don't know what to say or do. So they just yeah. don't talk to me anymore. I bet they don't know what to say. It's like, oh man, it's so sad and kind of frustrating. Yeah. Did you ever find a reporter or a journalist or a movie maker or somebody? to? She said she was going to go a hold of two guys in New York, and I've never heard about it since. Well, maybe somebody who's listening to the pod is interested in doing a documentary or feature on Dateline or something like that. People know people. Definitely. You would like to have more publicity, right? Yeah, it needs to be more aware. I mean, as far as Caucasian fathers, mm -hmm. the last cases that you can find, they're all Hispanic or African American. That get their kids back. That can stop adoptions. Huh. I haven't found a Caucasian father that's stopped an adoption. Really? I wonder yeah. what that race divide is. Do you know what that's about? I think it's because I think because white babies are more demanded. <gasps> of course. Oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah. It's a, such a dis deep and sickening racism that It's horrible. Yeah. There's like priceless and extra discounts. It's it's sickening. <laughs> yeah, it's I it, I'm sure that's why. I'm sure that's why. That's got to be why. Ah, jeez. I'm so it's, sorry. And the thing is these courts they're supposed to be protecting our rights. Yeah. They're supposed to be our advocates against transgressors. Sure. And here they are. They're yeah, the criminals. That's frustrating. People that that make the laws and put people in jail should be going to jail with them. Yeah. And they're all parents. That's a that's the most sickening thing is most of these judges are parents to children oh. themselves. Oh, geez. Can they even put themselves in your position? And it sounds like they're mostly men that are your. Well, it's mostly men, but there are women involved. Too. Yeah, sure. Ugh. Well, maybe somebody will step up and give you a new angle on this or help you get publicized. And even if it, I don't know, even if it doesn't result in you getting Eliza back, but to spread the awareness that this stuff still happens. Yeah, that's a, that, at this point, the, the only thing that can get Eliza to me is the U.S. Supreme Court granting my writ. Okay. And I, you know, yeah. but beyond that, I mean, I'm going to be an advocate for father's rights. Yeah. I do have the Free Eliza. It was supposed to be an organization, but it's one man operation right now. Okay. But yeah, just that's why I reached out to you is I, yeah. awareness of what's going on because this is not right. Absolutely not. Yeah, no, this is clearly to me a super big injustice for you and your daughter. And when she turns 18, you can go find her, right? Yeah. I mean, I know where she is right now all the time. Yeah. I'm assuming she'll reach out to me before 18. Yeah, hopefully. I'm assuming I'm going to get her. Let me put it that way. Yeah. I try not to think about that other, yeah. but just keep hoping that you'll get her. I mean, of course, that door has been kicking open more and more. So okay. it's like I do have to keep my mind on it. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to stay hopeful otherwise. It's it's sad because I don't want her, because she's going to learn. I mean, there's no telling what they're going to tell her. Yes, yeah, she, she probably doesn't think too highly of you right now because of what they've told her. Well, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure yeah. they've convinced themselves that I'm everything that lawyer said I was. Shoot. Even though it's no evidence in the record. Yeah. But the thing is, when she learns all that, this bothers me so much. When she learns all that, she's going to hate these people that she thought were her parents. Oh, yeah. There's going to be... So much ambivalence all around. Like, I really want to meet you, but that mental anguish yeah. to know how hard I fought for her. Yeah. After being told I'm, I'm a loser or whatever they're just going to say, I'm trying mm -hmm. to think about that. Yeah. The immorality is just, it's mind boggling how yeah. 
Well, first of all, if you're paying any attention, you know that he did what he was supposed to do. Yeah. And now that you've thwarted him, keeps fighting. Five years later, he's still fighting. Yeah. And all you do is keep going with the, you know, injustice. It's like, uh, I mean, how do you not have any morals? Yeah. When she figures all this out, she's going to be angry <laughs> at her parents and just. At the mother, too. And the mother. Yeah. Oh. Because she gets to see her. Oh, really? After all the crap she's done, she gets to see my daughter and I can't. So they're in an open adoption with the birth mom, but right. not with you. They were. I don't, obviously I don't talk to any of them. So at a certain point. Okay. These strangers shouldn't have that kind of like, because they can just cut it off anytime. Of course. Yeah, they that, tried to offer that to me. And I'm like, no, because as soon as I can't fight for her, you're going to say, I can't see her. You know, it's like, oh. honestly, it's just, it's the anger comes out and I'm not going to say anything angry, but it's just like, how can you be so bold? Yeah. You, you stole a child from somebody. Yeah. Honestly, that's what it is. It's not just me. It's my whole family. Yeah. My whole family's hurt. And the birth mom's family, too. It sounds like they're keeping the baby away from her, too. Or she's not a baby anymore. Yeah, Tana hasn't seen. I was able to bring family to see her when I was still visiting oh. her. Oh, good. And I only brought the mother's family. Because oh, wow. my parents were too ill to drive that far and all that. Oh, shoot. Oh. So you so. you reached across and brought the birth mom's family with you? Oh, yeah, I brought the birth mom's aunt and her two cousins. Oh. Yeah. And they're, they still talked. In fact, one of them just had a baby. So mm -hmm. I gave her some of the stuff I still had from Aww. like a rocking chair and some baby clothes. So she's really cute. Yeah. Oh, it must really pain you when you see other babies, though. I get that. Yeah, I try. I mean, yeah, it does. But also, I love babies. So they're still cute. Yeah. Well, you seem like such a good guy, Paul. And this is so unfair. I'm angry for you. And I've just heard about this. I can't imagine having five years of this and the struggles with the law and with these unhinged people it must just be super frustrating. And I hope that just being here and raising awareness gives you a little bit of feeling like, okay, well, we're helping other people. I don't know. Does right. that help you at all? <laughs> I mean, at this point, I, I want to help other people anyway, yeah. but yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does. I want to stop this from continuing. Yes, it's child trafficking is what it is. It's what it is, yeah. That child had a parent. Have you ever heard of uh, Melinda Seymour? Mm -mm. One of her articles is called Adopting Civil Damages, the Wrongful Termination of Rights. Oh. Um, it's blanking on me. But anyway, mm -hmm. I, I've used a quote of that in my recent brief. Oh, it's like, uh -huh. if a child has a parent uh -huh. that's willing and able, yeah. then it's not in her best interest to be adopted. No. Because adoption is about finding homes for babies, not about finding babies for families. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. I am totally a family preservationist. If there's family, then there's no need for adoption. Right. That's not what it's about. Exactly. Adoption is for when there's no one, no one that's available to take care of. Adoption is for babies that have been unwanted, abandoned. Yeah. And this child was only unwanted and abandoned by her mother. Yeah. The only one person. So. Shoot. Well, all of our listeners are going to be sending you good juju and compassion and hope your way. I'll keep you in my heart as well. And um, gosh, I hope something flips or switches or opens up for you and that you can continue working. Uh, you're working so hard. And I know that someday your daughter will realize all that you've done for her. And yeah. I really, I'll be, I'll be really thinking of you. Is there anything else that we can do as a community to help you besides just raising awareness, share the episode? <laughs> just raising awareness. Uh, you know, we got the website, freeeliza.com. We also have the Facebook page, which is just Free Eliza. Okay. But yeah, just awareness and being ethical, yeah. promoting ethics. Yes. Remembering that adoption is for babies that need families and not for families that need babies. Exactly. Yeah. And if people wanted to get a hold of you directly, it, would it be best through the website? They can do that through the website or my email is paul underscore fiscus at yahoo.com. Okay. I'll put all that in the notes in case anyone's driving right now. And yeah, share this episode to other people, maybe even people that aren't touched by adoption at all. So they go, oh my God, this is still happening in 2023. Are you kidding me? Right. Bring awareness to this. This is really important stuff. So, well, thank you, Paul, for sharing your heartbreaking story with us. I appreciate you being on. And I think that it's very important that, that we continue to share stories like this. Thanks for having me, Beth. 
You're very welcome. And if anyone wants to find out more about Unraveling Adoption, go find us at unravelingadoption.com. I do coach uh, adoptive parents and have events coming up all over the place. And there's all sorts of stuff. So go look it up on the website, unravelingadoption.com. And lastly, if you'd like to support Unraveling Adoption, you can join our Patreon. It's a super easy way to donate a small amount of money each month, or you could donate a lot if you wanted, but it starts at only $5 a month and everybody's chipping in really helps to defray the costs of making this podcast. So just go to patreon.com slash unraveling adoption. And I wanted to give a huge thank you to a brand new Patreon supporter, Nancy Collins. Welcome to Patreon and thank you for your support and all the other Patreon supporters as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And Paul and I want you all to stay Stay safe. safe.